hi everyone so just give it a couple minutes just to make sure we've got everyone in and then we'll get kicked off in a few minutes Right, so I think we've got everyone now. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Do Housing Differently. Um, this is our case study session. Um, it's great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, welcome back to those that have been with us so far this week, and welcome to all of those that's the first time joining us. Uh, so a bit of housekeeping just before we get going. Um, if you want to introduce yourself, just use the chat function, just pop in uh, where you're from. Um, kind of what your interest in housing is, just let, because you can't see everyone else, just kind of let them know who you are and um, what your interest is. Um, there's also a Q&A function, so if you've got any questions throughout um, the session, just pop them in there and we'll pick them up at the end. And if there's a Q&A, it just makes um, sure that we pick them up. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, so um, it'll be made available after all the events this week have taken place, and that'll be shared if you want to come back to it or if there's anyone you want to share this with that was unable to attend tonight. Uh, so tonight we're gonna to focus on the kind of successful case studies and take you on a bit of a tour around the east of England, um, the schemes and the different ways you could approach taking a community-led housing scheme forward. Um, so we've got Lavenham CLT, Canic Mill Co-Housing, Great Shelford Parochial Charities and Marmalade Lane. Um, hopefully by the end of the session, um, you'll have a bit of an idea of an insight into community led housing, the schemes that have taken place in our area, um, and what's involved in undertaking a project, and what some of the benefits and the challenges of undertaking those schemes can be. Uh, so, and obviously, if you've got any other questions, we'll try our best to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, so, we're all good to go, or won't dwell on it, and we'll kick off with Brian Hanson from um, Carol Reeve from Lavenham. Unmute myself. Good evening. Thanks, Jenna. I'm going to uh, open my screen now. Hopefully, we'll. Uh... Everybody got that? Just one. Thank you. I did got one acknowledgement there. Okay. My name is Brian Panton, and in the background is Carol Reeve, who is the chairman of our local CLT, Lavenham CLT, and I'm a trustee. Uh, have been from day one. Um, we're from Lavenham. I'm just making a note of the time so I don't overrun too much. Um, Lavenham, uh, it seems as though having the opening chat here with people, most people seem to know where it is, but that's our church. Just to give us a little bit of a background of where we are. Uh, popular tourist attraction when they're not coming to visit the uh, Guild Hall, which is also there. Um, as part of the village, uh, it does make it very popular with tourists. Um, but it's possibly interesting to note that although this was the 14th richest town in the country at one point, due to its wool trade and wool cloth, um, by the turn of uh, the last century, or uh, it had fallen into a, quite a large, uh, more or less demolition site it was falling apart people weren't really looking after it and so in the history of the village um, it was beginning to get into a terrible state around about then but some of the people local people had the idea that this may be a bit of a sad loss and so quite a lot of work went on to restore a lot of those buildings to bring them up to the sort of idea and the sort of stage we see today as the tourist attraction. Um, but of course, it's a progressive village. It's a living village. It's not a museum um, or just a tourist attraction. And there was a time when 
we began to think about uh, its future and how it sort of did fit. And in 2000, the village produced a design statement, which was an interesting document about how the village stood at that particular time. And that progressed on to a few years later, or quite a few years later in 2016, when a neighbourhood plan was produced. And we were one of the first uh, counties, or uh, certainly in uh, Suffolk, um, possibly in East Anglia, to produce a neighbourhood plan. And that neighbourhood plan, as part of it, identified certain issues. And those issues really lead up to where we are today. Um, the sort of things we were looking at were the fact that the, the village contained an excessive amount of 60 year olds and plus. Um, and now um, I have to say, I'm of course, firmly in that bracket, along with uh, Carol, our chairman and a lot of other people. So we have a high level of people of that age. The properties are, there's quite a mix of housing, but there's also quite really quite a lot of large housing. And it's influenced by tourism to the extent that 20% of our housing stock is either a second home or a holiday let. So this has a quite an impact on our housing. Primarily, it creates a high level of, of the price and it makes the area pretty much uh, inaccessible to youngsters and first time buyers, which has an impact on the uh, economy of the village because you need to employ these people within the village to run the services used by the older people who are doing it. And as a result of identifying these situations uh, within the neighbourhood plan, the Community Land Trust was formed with the view of trying to create more affordable housing. Uh, we conducted a consultation and the plan, uh, the group was basically formed in about uh, 2016 uh, with a lot of help from a lot of people. If anybody hasn't uh, created a community land trust at the moment, there is a lot of help about. Uh, there was then, but there's an awful lot more now. Um, we formed a team of uh, trustees and uh, they were varied had varied skills but they all came from the village and once that was in place we were then looking for a project so the project that we came up with we now call uh, Peak Close and Peak Close which is what I'll really be talking about now um, came as a result of looking for something to do looking for somewhere where we could build property and as part of that, we came to an agreement to acquire a site from Suffolk County Council in August 2014, um, which was a, a derelict gritting site that Suffolk County Council used to use, uh, just under an acre of ground, um, which we thought would be suitable. After a degree of uh, a consultation with the Suffolk County Councillors, District County Councillors, District Councillors rather, uh, a price was agreed and the site was acquired. Planning permission was granted in January 2017, uh, so we knew we could go ahead. And commencement on the site took place in March 2018. Give you some idea of the, uh, the time scale involved. And the properties were actually occupied in 2019. So that was the stages which it worked through. To just put a bit more meat on those bones, uh, this was the site um, when it was in operation as a gritting site. Um, it's on the south side of, of Lavenham, um, just on the Melford Road, but within uh, a 10, 15 minute walking distance to the center. Set out of the way, and you can see it was potentially had some uh, issues with it. This is a, a Google picture. Fairly early on in the stage, 
we realized it was necessary to come up with somebody to come up uh, design a project and this was the project that was designed but at the same time it was realized that this was a difficult thing to manage just totally by the the uh, uh, community land trust and so we really went into partnership with hasto and hasto took on all the the practical aspects of site work with the community land trust acquiring the land and working closely with hasto to to make it all happen um, so that was what we were planning uh, we then consulted with the uh, local population in various ways this is was a, just a shot of a couple of people having a good look at the plans and deciding and telling us what they thought and generally it had a good reception and so uh, we were quite happy to be moving forward we then had to work on the site and it was down to us to uh, clear the site because we did manage to acquire the site ultimately for the cost of one pound the site clearance though was down to us and i think was in the order of twenty thousand. Uh, carol who's in the background will correct me if i get any of these numbers actually wrong we put the builders on and uh, the, some of the people who were involved in this uh, project going on hasto i've already mentioned ourselves the community land trust the, the local council homes england and the, the, the and so on and we were able to detail down there in the center of the picture you can see that what was being built on the site which was 18 houses uh, two three bedroomed houses uh, for sale um, sorry not for sale some were for um, part ownership and others were only going to be available for rent and that was oh and the other people on there were the uh, the builders who were we became very friendly though I did personally uh, in, in seeing the way in which the site was constructed in March uh, we had the sod turning with a few people present, as you can see, uh, the, along with the builders, there's our local MP and a few others uh, came to see the project on its way. We progressed through building the site up nicely um, and uh, it gave us an opportunity, or it certainly gave me personally actually an opportunity to see what the benefits of some of these houses were the houses were built to um aecb standard the association of environment conscious building yes it is something like that standard and the secrets of that were hasto had in their thoughts that affordable housing was not just a question of having an affordable rent but it had to be affordable to run so these houses were built with triple glazing, a very uh, extensive um, insulation. They had to be leak proof, which was tested by pressure testing. I for, forgive me if people understand these terms and these things anyway, but I always think it's worth mentioning. And it means that the properties have potentially an annual running cost of between 120 and 150 pounds compared to an average one. The build cost, however, in that is probably about 7% more than a regular build cost would have been. But there we go, they were the houses, they did appear and you can see there some of the, um, well, you can actually, one of the reasons I took that photograph was because you could see the various stages of the insulation going on in various parts of the buildings which uh, has made it quite interesting as it approached completion you'll find that the little dob in the middle of the square there will uh, its importance will arise in a second um, and we got to as this sort of stage when whereby we thought well it's possibly worth comparing it with what we were trying to build which was that and that is exactly what we built. So that was the, the site as it was completed. Um, 
and uh, this is a typical house just before occupation after the ground uh, works had been done. I put this one in because this was uh, a work of art which was a condition of the planning permission that we did put in the piece of art. This was done by a local artist um, in conjunction with the children at the primary school and preschool and uh, is based on the fact that the uh, poem Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was written in Lavenham and they use that as a project and you can't really see it but on the top they painted all the constellations and it was felt that uh, this was quite a good uh, theme and it gave the children of the village because all their initials are on it some sort of ownership of that piece of art. So really that was peak close. Um, I can stop now or I can just make a couple of points. How am I doing for time? I can see you, Jenna, if you want to just indicate whether you'd like me to stop. Uh, you've got a couple more minutes of seeing how few points you wanted to cover. Yeah, okay. Um, a few key points, look at that, it's as if by magic. Um, just the positive side of this, it created a lot of engagement with the local community and partners. We learned a lot. We worked together to get this whole project going. And we were able to make good use of local knowledge for things. Most of the things went, even the, the piece of art was done by a very local artist, only a short distance away. And so they went on and it taught us all an awful lot of perseverance. <laughs> that if you work at a project like this, you can actually achieve quite a thing. There were, of course, some negatives. Um, risks across the there, there was, I mean, we were all getting together and of course it's quite an expensive project. There is quite a high risk. And I think it's actually underneath this on the right-hand side there, it says uh, contamination. Uh, there was some concern at the beginning because the site had been an industrial brownfield site. There may have been some contamination in the ground. Um, fortunately, none was found. So the uh, potential costs of that were low, but it's worth remembering that uh, these things happen. There was some problems, I suppose you could say that with commitment across various people. We had to deal with an awful lot of people and you need to get a lot of people to be in agreement. So we did have lots of meetings and tried to get as many people involved as possible to overcome those problems. And the last point we would make in there, although we think, I personally think this now moves into a positive, uh, the availability of information was uh, limited then, but really that I believe has now changed because people watching this today are listening and seeing projects from us and from others which have really happened and certainly Lavenham Community Land Trust and I, I, I guess the others as well are very happy to share our knowledge and information and our experiences with others um, so don't feel you're alone if you're new to this game and looking to get into it. Um, Carol certainly has been around and talked to a number of groups and I've talked to a few as well but we're always happy to pass on our knowledge and our information. Uh, our, well, yeah, our information the, as, as best we can. And that's just another little picture to finish it off, showing that the, the, a bit of a collage of what's going on and a bit about the uh, bit work of art. Thank you. Great, thanks for that, Brian. That was really great. And it's a um, really lovely scheme. I think it's obviously had a lot of attention, but it's really fab to hear the story behind it and share it with everyone that's here tonight. Okay, I'll hand you the screen back. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go on to something a bit different, more di uh, a bit different now, if I can get my words out. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a chat with um, Barbara and Phil from Cannockville Co Housing in Colchester. So Phil and Barbara, if you want to come off mute and we'll get going. Okay. Great. So, if you just want to introduce yourselves quickly, I'll be fab. Okay. So, um, introduce I'm Barbara. I'm from Cannock Mill. I'm a founder member and I'm gobsmacked at how quickly Lavender got off the ground compared with us. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Phil McGeever and I'm almost oh. a founder member and uh, yeah, I, it took us a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so do you just want to kind of give a quick kind of brief, like what the scheme is and kind of just quickly tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, I, I just want to say a little bit about how we got started. So we started off, we were a group of friends in London. Of, um, what, somebody knew something about co-housing and liked the idea and brought us all together. And we met for a few months trying to work out what co-housing was and what we might like, what, well, what our interests, what we might be looking for. Um, and that took a few months um, and then we decided we needed to enlarge the group so we each wrote to 10 people we knew and that's how Phil came because I knew Phil and, um, and so the group started growing from that point. Yeah, co-housing co is where you have your separate home but you have some shared space and usually a common house and that's uh, an important feature of it. Great. So, kind of, what was like just to kind of explain to me what was kind of really important when you're kind of picking a site? Because I, I kind of obviously know a bit about my process you went through. So, do you just want to explain to people about kind of what you were looking for in a site and kind of what co housing meant when you were trying to pick your site out? Well, we <clears throat> we we were looking for something we could afford, really, uh, and uh, that ruled out, say, London or perhaps Surrey. Uh, we were thinking. Uh, you know, you have to decide what you don't want. And we looked at a lot of sites that we, you know, were very much in the countryside and we had that kind of rush of blood about self-sufficiency and then thought, well, we're all a bit old and having to drive everywhere is not what we want. So in, in the end, we narrowed it down and we didn't really want to live in somewhere that was like a commuter place that everyone left to, to work somewhere else. And we then found this site in Colchester. And we, we, we love Colchester, it's, a, it's a, a, a wonderful town with its own center of gravity. But the, the thing about co-housing is you need to find something that a developer doesn't want, that you want. And the common house can often be that. So we have an old listed mill, which would have been a pain in the neck for a developer, but for us was, wow this could be our shared space where we can have meals together and and you know recreational space and guest rooms and things like that so for us that was really attractive and that that was what we bought that's great um so you kind of already touched on this about finance being quite a big uh kind of aspect of the co-housing at any community-led housing scheme so do you just want to talk a bit about how kind of you funded the scheme and why you did it that way and how you kind of made sure it was a financially viable thing that you could actually bring to fruition as it is now? Sure. I mean, when we started, we didn't have a clue how we were going to fund it. I mean, we didn't want to sell our houses and live in a caravan for a few years. We did know that. But we, after a couple of years, we partnered with a housing association and our purpose partnering with them was threefold, really. Uh, we wanted them to help us find a site because although we've looked at sites all over the place, none of them were really suitable. Uh, the second reason we want, we were hoping they would cash flow the project, well, actually that was probably the first reason, but um, uh, we thought we saw that as a solution. And the other thing we thought uh, partnering with the Housing Association, would it would mean that we could have a more diverse um, ownership models. Um, we wanted um, affordable housing and we weren't sure how to do that but we thought if we had a housing association then that, that might be solved um so we, we we negotiated with them for a good two years i would say and after that after the two years we hadn't achieved any of those things and so i think by then we kind of thought oh this isn't really working but in the meantime of course we'd all got much older or a bit older and some of us had retired um and we had pension pots and um we, we, we found that we had enough money between all of us to buy the land um, and so that's what we did and of course then we had this um, asset that was worth more than a million pounds. Um, we had someone who'd worked in housing association development for all their professional lives and they found the homes and communities agencies um, home building fund and we applied for a loan we applied for three and a half million 
uh, 150 projects were funded, but ours was the only co-housing project that was supported actually. And their risk analysis was very onerous and it took about, I don't know, maybe a year to get through all the, um, the hoops that they put us through. Um, but we were successful. They charged an interest rate of 6%, which was quite extortionate, but they thought that we were a risky project because um, you know, we were funding it ourselves and we were a group of kind of, you know, elderly hippie type people. They didn't quite trust us or anything. But anyway, well, they, they trusted us enough to give us a loan at 6%. Um, and the balance of funds that we needed, so the whole building project itself came to 10 million actually. So, uh, and we funded the balance through additional loans. If people wanted a house, they had to put a minimum of 10% deposit and lots of people put down more than that actually. We had a brilliant marketing effort. So there were a constant stream of inquirers looking to join us. And once we had a site uh, that was marketable, we were able to attract uh, much, much more interest in what we were doing because it was very specific. Um, uh, so we did, we had, we did take tax. We, well, we, one of the reasons that I think that we were successful was we have an extraordinary um, array of skills in our group. Uh, as I say, we had a housing association developer who knew about housing finance, we had a charter accountant, we had four architects, one of whom was our scheme architect, actually. Um, we had a quantity surveyor subsequently. Uh, in fact, the only skill we, we didn't have throughout this project really was, um, a, we didn't have a solicitor. I mean, we weren't recruiting people like that, but we attracted people like that. Um, who decided they liked the idea of co-housing and, and they put their faith. They thought the project was going to succeed and that gave us all um, a, a lot of um, you know, confidence. That's great. Um, so you just kind of mentioned as well that you had an architect as kind of one of your members and residents. So kind of when you were designing your scheme, obviously that came in quite, quite very handy. Um, but kind of when you were designing, what were the most important things to you and what were the aspects that you kind of wanted or maybe even the things maybe you had to kind of compromise on to kind of bring forward the scheme well we the it's great to have an architect because they can basically look at a site and say you could build this on this and how you know is this the sort of thing you want is in, and that gets you to you know to, to first base the uh, right from the start in fact long before we had a site we sort of agreed amongst ourselves that we wanted to build it to passive house standards and that we never wavered in that uh, we had to do quite a bit of value engineering to, to bring costs down but we never never moved away from that also using materials that were you know not non-toxic uh, sustainable drainage all, all of these things were i think we enough of us were committed to that kind of build to do it and as brian was saying in terms of running costs you know building things in, in a way that you're not going to have a lot of maintenance, but also very low energy bills was a big plus for us. No, that's great. So obviously you kind of started touching, but kind of what are the main benefits you two personally kind of had from living in co-housing and why would you recommend it as kind of, I know it's not, it's not a lifestyle for everyone, but kind of what, why have you chosen that route? Uh, well, we're both going to say something here, but I mean, the, I suppose I know that it's been locked down, but actually co-housing's really come into its own during this period because uh, the houses are designed with a series of balconies along the top, so you can chat to your neighbours just standing on your balcony and observe all the restrictions that we're under at the moment. So there's be, there, there's a big community, and it, and we've managed to to build that despite all the restrictions on what we do. There are all sorts of group activities we've got we've had, uh, mostly on zoom i mean we've had pottery workshops we've had discussion groups um we work the land outside once a week for half a day when we mix with each other um and uh, we've we've got a veg shop we have the vegetables delivered every week so um uh, there is a there's been an amazing amount of community life here despite the restrictions we're under yeah. I, I, I think the benefits I particularly point to is the availability of help and advice. So if you have to move something heavy, 
you've suddenly got two people to help you, or if you want to know how you change the filters on the MVHR, you know, there's, there's someone there. And I think also the, the kind of security and support I think particularly for the single members of the community. I mean, we had one of our members who, who woke up with a dreadful pain and feeling awful. I, I mean, it was two minutes after he sent that message, he had someone around who had some medical experience and half an hour later, there was an ambulance. And when he returned from hospital, there were, you know, there's a series of meals and visits and, and these kinds of things. and although none of us want to think about those things, knowing that that is the sort of community you're in, I think is a, is a really big plus. Yeah, it's really lovely to hear because you see, you kind of read that co-housing is wonderful for communities, but it's really great hearing your first-hand stories of how that's happened for you. So one last question I'm going to ask you is, after being through the whole process, what would be your kind of key advice you'd give to any groups considering co-housing? Uh, well, what, I mean, it, it, there, there are lots of things we could say. Uh, what, one of the things is con thinking about how you make your group work. So consider whether you've got people who've got facilitation skills and, and decision making, um, how you want to make decisions. So those kinds of discussions. Uh, this might be controversial to some people, but we say we don't want any rules. We, so we don't, I mean, we do have a few rules. None of them are written down, actually, um, and we don't want rules. Um, and we want to get on with everybody. We don't want any sort of factionalism at all. So everyone wants to get on with everyone. Uh, and maybe the most <laughs> important thing, although Lavalon might not agree, it's going to take longer than you think. You know, um, it's to, I think from the beginning till we moved in, I, I don't like to count, but it was it must have been 14 years, I would say. So, you know, I hope things might have changed and that might not be so for future groups, but it was that 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 was a kind of shocking thing really yeah i i would say that if we we are essentially a senior group although we don't have any age limits uh, low or high but uh you know start early you know <laughs> if, if you if you start doing it when you think you're ready for it you're too late you know? uh i'd say things like rotate the roles don't have just a few people who are taking all the decisions and, and you know get everyone involved uh don't 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 over anticipate problems you know just have a flexible way of dealing with them when they arise you know so i'd agree with with barbara about uh not, not having lots of rules and i think the, the most important thing for us and certainly our financial model depended on this was developing a very high level of trust between each other mm -hmm. so although there were legal agreements at various times of course but people were putting in really quite large sums of money on an interest-free basis and that that is is quite something to, to happen but that only developed over time yeah 14. yeah <laughs> do, do i have time to just show a couple of slides is that yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, it's a really lovely it's a really lovely picture of scheme so it'd be a real shame to talk about it and not get to see it so okay, yeah go ahead. i'll see if i can get that up okay so that's what the site looks like here's you know these are the when we were meeting these are the people who bought the site there's the mill is the back of the mill <laughs> and that's looking down towards the mill the mill would be uh, just just hidden by that that wooden building uh building site one of the kitchens that's a balance sheet <laughs> those are all in thousands so you know it's quite expensive uh the outside of the house you know cycling a trailer a work day in, in the, the mill yeah here's some balconies having a toast at christmas and that's just what the place looks like across the uh, the pond the mill pond so lovely thank you so much phil and barbara it's been really great to hear your story and as i think someone's just popped in the chat well worth the wait it looks yeah we think so yes definitely lovely thank you very much uh so
Moving on, uh, again, we're going to have a look at something a little bit different again, and we're going to have a chat, well, we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Sarah and Brian from J uh, Great Shelford Procure Charities to have a talk about what the work they've been doing. Thanks, Jenna. So I'm Sarah Ran, and I'm the chair of the uh, Great Shel Shelford Parochial Charity. Um, we um, operate in a village about five miles south of Cambridge, um, and Adam Brooks Hospital is um, not infrequently in our sites when we go walking. Um, and as you might imagine, it's quite an expensive place to live. And I think it was alluded to before, if you've got an expensive place to live, it's very difficult for people on low incomes. Uh, even hospital workers to live close to their place of work. So the charity has been around for quite a long time. It was formed in 1890, which was actually the, the, the merging of three small, very small charities that had been um, set up by individuals bequeathing properties for the good of the village um, over many years. And our, own, our sole purpose is the relief of need, hardship and distress in the village. We do it um, by having uh, currently 32 homes, which were built in 1990. Part of the land that we were bequeathed um, was in the green belt. Some were allotments, some were properties. And we saw, um, the trustees at that time sold some land to a developer to allow them to have the money to build 32 homes on what were originally allotments behind a row of cottages on, on a main road. And one, two and three bedroomed homes were, were built. We aim to uh, let them out at 50% of the market rate. They're actually running up less than that at the moment, but we're catching up with ourselves. Um, and in the past, we ran a waiting list and people would ask and then stay on the waiting list for as long as it took. We've now moved to a slightly different approach where if somebody moves out um, of the property, we will actually advertise and people will apply, be shortlisted and interviewed. And we have now started the process of all our properties becoming almshouses. Um, we're not a registered provider, so we're allowed to have um, our own stipulation about who lives in our properties. Part of our land um, behind the, 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 the homes, um, we have another sort of 10 acres of land and we have looked at that and decided that we would like to build more properties, but also create green space uh, for the community because the village is actually short on green space. And we have done that by, we've sadly had to move the um, allotments, um, the current allotments that people have been using into a new space. Um, but we've got a lovely, beautiful green space in between the, the now allotments and what will be our build. We also give grants to individuals, families and good causes within the village, which is an absolute treat to be able to provide funding for people. And the charity is run by seven trustees um, with the su lovely support of a clerk. We don't have staff or an office. And I think it's been alluded to before, but I'm very fortunate as the chair to have a group of trustees who bring a wealth of expertise experience, skills and enthusiasm to, to running anything for the charity. Brian, I think you're on there. Okay. Next. Hello, my name is Brian Canellan. I sit alongside Sarah. I'm, I'm a trustee of the charity. Just trying to bring up the next slide. Oh, I just jumped a few. Beg your pardon, I'm just going to go back a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, things started in 2017 when we made um, our first uh, uh, pre-application to the to the district council um, uh, to extend the 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 estate that we've got at the moment. As Sarah said, we've got 32 arms houses now, and we we were looking to build some more. So in 2017, we got our, the architect who designed the original um, houses that we have um, to submit a further application. This was for 20 houses. That was turned down um, uh, and the uh, council said that they felt we were trying to put too many properties on, on uh, Greenbelt land. The site is just over the village boundary. Um, and although it's adjacent to our existing properties, it is technically within the Cambridge Greenbelt. Um, 
shortly after that in 2017 there was a parish council survey was done and they identified a need for 100 further affordable homes within the village um, so that gave us further impetus really to have another go so this time around um, uh, we engaged quite a few consultants we brought in a community housing consultant uh, we went for an architect with prior experience of this type of housing and we engaged a planning consultant as well and um, uh, the architect came up with a new uh, design sensitive to the Greenbelt site and um, uh, the design he came up with was of high quality architecture and landscaping. Um, this pre-application that we put in was for 21 units, uh, a mixture of one bed, two bed and three bedroom properties. Um, because it was in the green belt as well, we needed to make special efforts to, to show that we were sensitive to the location. So included in the, in the, in the submission, in the pre-application, um, was a plan for community allotments, community garden, community orchard, and quite a lot of green space. Um, uh, that went well. So that pre-application went through and it went well, it was accepted. So it gave us the impetus then to go for a full uh, planning application. Um, as you'll see on the next sl slide, a, a, a pretty expensive process. We're at a stage now where that's just been approved, subject to us meeting certain uh, conditions, which were in the which we're in the uh, throes at the moment of discharging. Um, we, 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 we've also in parallel been through the competitive tendering process for the construction and we've appointed a contractor. One sort of slight shadow on the horizon, um, the uh, government um, uh, has created a consortium called East West Rail to construct a railway track between Oxford and Cambridge. We're not quite sure where it goes yet but it, it's going to be near the village if not if if not in the village um, so that's just a mild concern uh, we're hoping it, it won't affect us but the existing railway line between Cambridge and London passes about 70 yards away so we're hoping we're not going to be too close to this new east-west rail link so the, so the plan from here on is that construction starts in quarter two uh, sometime in the next three months and we, we anticipate completion towards the end of next year. Uh, on the next slide, I've just covered uh, here approximately how much we've spent. Uh, we've spent on planning, we spent just over a third of a million pounds. Um, the cost of construction, this is high quality architecture, so the houses are relatively expensive, but given that these are arms houses, we expect, and our charity has been around for 130 years, ideally we want um, these houses to last for another 130 years. So this is high quality architecture. So the construction cost is quite high, 4.3 million pounds. Um, and effort to, in, in order to get the planning permission as well, we had to put quite a lot of effort into the landscaping, as I said, allotments and community gardens and things. The projected cost of that is 55K. Uh, grants, um, we, we had a Homes England um, uh, community housing fund grant um, towards the planning costs so that was a quarter of a million pounds and um, uh, we were successful as well in getting um, a very good grant from the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough combined authority and that's just over a million pounds um, towards the construction cost we also had a private donor um, uh, who's covering a lot of the cost of the landscaping the balance uh, will be taken out of the reserves that the charity has got. Um, and uh, uh, we have got a loan as well from the charity bank. At this point, I'll hand back to Sarah. Thank you. So yes, it's, we're, we're about to spend a lot of money and we're doing it ourselves. We're very keen to um, keep these properties um, owned and managed by us. Um, and uh, that's uh, been an interesting time for us. We, we, we found there's some key learning from all of this. And one was to really go for as much background supporting information as possible. We're looking at the village plan, looking at the housing needs survey, wildlife surveys, you name it, look at it, think of the highways, whatever it is, make sure you've really looked at all the things that might throw you a googly to make sure you've got that ready. 
uh, working with the um, local authorities really helpful. And as Brian mentioned, having some um, really able consultants and um, Jenna and, and the Eastern Community Trust have been absolutely fantastic in supporting us through this. The planning um, has been a lot of discussion, having consultants who work well with the planning authority and can discuss and um, flex with them is really helpful. Community engagement, um, we have done um, particularly with our current tenants because this new development will be um, mean more cars going th down their road and also with the village to make sure that people are on board, think it's a positive thing and that if there are things that are worrying anyone that we can try and manage that. One of the issues we had was that we were moving um, the allotments or putting our new builds behind some houses that were um, uh, um, uh, privately owned and dealing, making sure that the residents were informed, understood what we were doing and were with us on that was really important. Networking with other charities with a similar focus has been really helpful. Um, and so hearing what other people have been doing, pinching with pride is what I call it, um, and do it, do it with gay abandon if you're going to take on these projects. And also um, working with local charities um, who might offer a slightly different take on what they do to support the village. Um, and that's what was certainly something we've done in terms of thinking about who will go into the homes and how, how they will be supported. So I think I, I mentioned that we now have an application process if we have an empty property. And we do this um, um, in collaboration with our partners in a, another local village in Sauston where they have support workers. And one of the um, massive benefits of that is that, that individuals and families who are applying for these homes are also um, in conversation with trained support workers who are fantastic at making sure that people are actually getting all the right benefits they should be getting, attendance allowances. So it's been a really positive, um, positive experience. We discovered, um, well, we didn't discover, but we knew that um, we needed to look at our charitable deeds we are, are an unincorporated charity. So all the trustees are individually responsible and liable for the finances. Um, so that's where the money side sort of makes some people hyperventilate. And we are absolutely in the process of becoming incorporated so that the trustees are safe. That doesn't mean we haven't got a responsibility to manage the funds appropriately. Um, and that, that's what we're also very lucky that one of our trustees is a lawyer and is able to liaise appropriately with people to see us through that process. Um, as I said, we have only have seven trustees at the moment um, and uh, we have an amazing range of skill sets running from Brian, who is an expert on project management, to having a lawyer, to having an accountant, to having someone who manages the land well. Um, it's, it's just amazing to have that skill set around the table with people who are willing to volunteer their time and services. We also have people who volunteer and help us um, with um, some of the landscape um, issues. And finally, the most important thing we've learned is to be patient, have persistence, flexibility and good humour. These homes are going to be there for a very long time. The charity's already been around for a long time. So we can play the long game because we are going to do this and it's going to be something that we're, the village is going to be proud of for, for many years and to support people who find it difficult to live here and we'd like to live here. And that's about it, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much for that. That was really interesting and really great to hear about. Uh, so, <coughs> we're perfectly on time, so I'm gonna hand over to Francis Wright, um, he's from Marmalade Lane, and I'll let you tell us a little bit about Marmalade Lane, Francis. Brilliant. Uh, let me just share my screen. There we go. Thank you for inviting me. It's been lovely to listen to all the different projects because they're so different. <laughs> And, and being presented so differently. So I am going to talk about Marmalade Lane, which, um, that's the front slide, repeats lane twice, but let's go. Um, and it is in Cambridge, in South Cambridgeshire. And I think I noticed someone from South Cambridgeshire Council in the attendance list. Um, and what's unusual about Marmalade Lane, it was 
was how it was procured because the land was owned by Cambridge City Council and so as a co-housing project that's quite an unusual journey. So I'm going to focus quite a bit on the procurement side, uh, less on the co-housing side because I, we've already had a co-housing group and a little bit about the design elements. So Marmalade Lane is in Orchard Park, which is one of the sort of fringe developments around Cambridge, uh, sort of showing you the A14. Uh, it's part of a wider development of about a thousand homes. And the circle shows a plot called K1, which is where Marmalade Lane is. And it has a history. So the history is that the during the last financial crash, mainstream developers in Orchard Park had a tendency to walk away and the council owned this plot and here that's what happened. And um, the council started to think about their options and decided it was an opportunity to innovate. Um, so this was about raising the standards for design, raising the standards for sustainability, improving community cohesion. They were looking at group self-build. They'd been to Freeburg uh, and were quite inspired by that. Uh, that sort of developed into an interest in co-housing for the sort of added social benefits it might bring, not just to the residents in the co-housing community, but to Orchard Park as a whole. And um, importantly, the the site had been um, allocated for all market sale. It was a capital receipt that the council was counting on. So they wanted to keep, um, make sure they still got a good capital receipt. And that those objectives were married with, well, if it was going to be co-housing, then the co-housing principles needed to be upheld. And we've already heard a bit about that, but one is that they're intentional communities, that they're typically co-designed with residents and managed ultimately by residents. And, um, and that there's resident involvement from inception to occupation and beyond. So here we are in the K1 community. And that they're designed for sociability with an emphasis on shared spaces for shared lives, really. So that's a top level summary of co housing. And here is the K1 plot. And um, on the left is the original master plan for the area with um, the emphasis on active frontages and courtyard gardens and especially courtyard parking. And then on the right is the group that begins to form around this land opportunity so that it wasn't that there was a large co-housing group in the area. There was one, it had been going from about the year 2000 and hadn't got anywhere. And so by 2012, there were just um, two or three people from that original group who were still going and were interested in supporting something to happen there and the council challenged the group that embryonic group really to grow around this land opportunity and so the group did that and we're given the time to do that and also to develop a brief and this is their their brief and in the middle is um is the vision for where the co-housing's common house would be. And so with that, with that brief, the council then uh, went through a procurement process um, after that and the land was put out for sale with a tender process that involved two stages. The first, which was 100% on quality, and then the second, which had the mixture of quality and price. And the result was a three party sales contract, which aligned the interests of the enabling developer, the landowner and the co-housing group. Which really this image is capturing and that is an image of Marmalade Lane, which is an unadopted road running through the community. And co uh, Marmalade Lane is the 42 homes at all market sale with a mixture of flats and apartments, half and half and they're organized on four terraces. So this is Marmalade Lane and then the other three terraces surround the shared garden. So my next few slides just to describe how it came together because it's a different route to, to the route we've experienced in Colchester. 
you have town on board and I actually now work for town through the tendering process and immediately three months afterwards town worked intensively with the group to refine the design and also worked with the South Cambridgeshire planners and this is the uh, resulting plan for the site you can see that the cars are all pushed to the side of the site and around the edges and the common house still is in the center but in a slightly different location and the emphasis is on that shared garden They're quite small personal gardens and um, this this lane which is designed to be car free and um, it was a collaborative design process uh, where town liaised with members through a developer working group of five or six people and then through into work streams which were open groups of the members focused on the areas they were particularly interested in and that spanned the whole spectrum so it went right from what kind of energy supply do we want how do we want the common house to be house designs all the way through into the legal process around the purchase and then the sales and outreach. And this is the result. Um, let's give you a good overview of the site. And what's interesting is with this version, this um, bank of trees has been preserved through the design. It's actually quite old. It's probably about 150 years old and it's marking a, uh, one of the sort of administrative boundaries. Um, and here is a comparison between Marmalade Lane and the neighbouring site. And I always like this slide because it compares the differing outcomes and what you get if you are prepared to walk a little bit further for your car <laughs> parking. Um, because the blue areas are highlighting spaces that are reserved for cars or car movement. And right in the centre of the one in the on the left is actually a, a public open space. It's that tiny little space in the center that has been left as a result of the design. Uh, and so you get a quite good comparison about the impact of the design. Um, here's another picture showing you Marmalade Lane and you can see how it's really been designed for sociability. All the walls are very low and there are these extra sort of sitting seating spaces all around and the lane really is being used to for play and for socialization rather than moving cars around and here is a view into the shared garden in the foreground is are some uh, growing spaces which is used to supply food for the shared meals and this is a view inside the common house um, which in addition to this space has three guest bedrooms and a shared laundry and some quite flexible spaces and there's also a small gym and a workshop also on the site and one of the challenges for the group was that it had to be all market sale and the group was really hoping for a multi-generational community and the way that was achieved was making sure there was a real mix of house sizes and prices resulting from that and so this image shows you uh, one of the terraces and actually along this terrace it goes from one bed to five bed um, in a quite harmonious way it uses um, uh, a sort of Tyneside flat approach so in the uh, on the right hand side is a one bed with a two bed over and the two bed over can be converted into its loft space to create a three bedroom home and then lastly, just showing you uh, the methods of construction, which are all timber based. And then here is just the last slide. These aren't um, in your area, but they're work that town is doing. So on the left is a town centre regeneration in um, Wolverton. It's currently in planning. It's about 120 homes, but right in the centre of um, the town centre is going to be an older person's co-housing community of about 30 properties of which four will be social housing and again it's organised around a courtyard garden and quite low parking facilities and then on the right uh, is um, a site in Norwich which is owned 
by a co-housing group and it's been they purchased it in 2015 they've been really struggling to get it going since then and hopefully this year <laughs> we will be putting a, an application for planning with them for a co-housing community which they are hoping to have a couple of homes that will support people with learning disability to trans to transition to more independent living as part of their co-housing community so that's a quick overview of um, Marmalade Lane and some other co-housing contexts. Great, thanks so much for that, Francis. It's really good and it's kind of good to show people as well. It's, it doesn't, it's not always affordable housing, but obviously there are different ways of doing it and it's really interesting to see a different approach to it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move into our Q&A session. Um, if you've got any questions that you want to pose to any of the speakers tonight, please pop them in the chat over Q&A and we'll pick them up. Um, so to start off, we had one in a little while ago for Canic Mill um, and it's kind of asking about if you've had anyone leave, um, what your arrangements kind of would be when that situation does happen, if it hasn't already happened. Oh, Phil, you're on mute still. <laughs> Uh, this is very, very topical because we moved in uh, just over a year ago and uh, six, six weeks ago, somebody decided they needed to leave. It was someone who was trying to, to, to work in London and have a flat there and work here and her, her work had dried up rather and it just became impossible. Uh, and so we have a procedure, we have a waiting pool and we had to uh, find a buyer for, for, for this and we fixed the price. There's a procedure for that in, in the lease. And we had, uh, well, we, we sent off to our waiting pool. It, this is a quite small, this is one bedroom flat. And we had three people who were particularly interested in that. And we've had a two stage process and the, 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 the final stage was this afternoon. Of going through that so that sale is now now hopefully going through uh, but yeah that's the first person we've had had leave but i think uh, it was the fact that we had three people interested was really down to the work of the of the membership group that sustained this waiting pool we didn't want to have a waiting list with people in a rank uh, we just wanted to keep the interest of people who who'd who'd expressed an interest before and in normal times we would have been in to activities and social events and so on and we did that to some extent in as much as we were able during the last year um, but we were clear that we wanted to cultivate their interest in case such a situation as has arisen should arise and it, and it's been very successful and we we're also pleased with it because we have uh, a Victorian house that we have planning permission to, to, to convert into three two bedroom flats. And we were worried about the price, you know, uh, in, in terms of the, the tenders we had. But I think we're confident that we should be able to, to make that project work. And that will be part of the scheme in the future. Great, thank you very much. I hope that answers the question, but um, that's great. Um, so let me have a look. So, um, Francis has been quite a few come in that I think kind of ones that are more aimed at Marmalade Lane. Um, so, first, it's kind of about how the running costs are kind of divided between residents, obviously, because you've got quite a range of kind of size properties and that kind of thing. So, I don't know if you want to have a stab at that. Oh, Francis, you've left yourself on mute as well. <laughs> our, um, our service charge is based on a per household for the shared areas um, and then the sort of uh, costs that would normally be um, relate to apartments like building insurance that's based on size so for any household here they're paying probably 43 pounds a month for the shared facilities 
we do a lot of the work ourselves from accounting, bookkeeping, cleaning, uh, managing all the facilities. We do all of that ourselves. So that £43 a month actually is covering lots of things that might not normally be in a service charge, like the bird food budget and the chalk for the lane. And, you know, so the sort of the extras that make life living here really nice are covered by that amount. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, while I've still got you, there's another one. Um, someone just asked a bit about why there was no affordable housing and if you could maybe explain that a little bit. Uh, I think it's just, um, it's it's just comes back to the history of the site. In a way it was master planned originally and the way the plots were sold up, this plot was all designated for market sale and didn't trigger that requirement. Um, yeah, so that, that's just how it is in, that, in terms of our history. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think the rest are kind of uh, open to anyone. So if you all kind of want to chip in for anything. Um, so kind of with the schemes, um, what kind of things did you do kind of development stage to kind of engage with your local community and kind of make sure it was kind of that project that did involve the community and proceeded in that way? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer for that or... I can. <clears throat> yeah, what, what, what we did with engagement was basically we, we issued newsletters, we had meetings, uh, we had drop-in days, we had drop-in half days. Um, we would often hold a session in one building in the village on, say, a Sunday morning and another building in the village on a Wednesday evening. Um, we really pumped the engagement very, very hard because we were developing the community land trust as we were also writing our neighbourhood development plan. So they linked quite well and they both were well, the neighbourhood development plan process requires a, a lot of what I call sincere engagement rather than pure consultation, um, which people can see through. So you've really got to engage with people and it's really important. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it demands a lot of, hard work but there's frankly no other way of doing it. Great Carol thanks for that. Um, does anyone else want to add anything or shall I move on? Oh Brian you're muted if you wanted to add something. <laughs> uh, I was going to answer the question that's come up here about what issues we found that waiting lists have thrown up versus fresh advertising. Just to say that um, I mean, co-housing isn't for everyone, and our houses are relatively expensive because they're passive house, which really puts about 10% on your average house price, and plus people own a share of the, <clears throat> the mill, the common house. Um, and so cultivating relationships with people who've expressed an interest uh, over time gives us the opportunity to help people understand exactly what's involved in co-housing and actually what you're getting for your money you're not just getting a house you're getting a whole lifestyle um and uh, it's really important you know it's, people don't make those decisions overnight it's not like just buying a house it's a whole big thing and people need a long time to think and decide whether it's for them and so having the waiting pool enables those relationships to build Brian, do you want to add something on the previous question again quickly? Oh, I was going to say the Great Shelford. I think we held uh, uh, three public engagement uh, sessions altogether, and the final one was, was, was quite large. In fact, the final one was organised by the Parish Council, and there were 70 or 80 people there. Um, we had a newsletter that went around as well, and we put various articles in the Village News. Um, yeah, but it is a key a key part I think of, of of getting the planning permission you know you really need to show that you you have got the you have got the village on board you've got the parish council on board in particular lovely thank you um, so again another one to kind of I think this is probably more towards the co-housing groups um oh, I'm just going to have um CLTs differ but kind of how much control do residents have over the design process and is there anything kind of Good advice for if you kind of consider specific issues even if it's kind of around quality and diversity if it's kind of anything how you bring those issues into play as well i know you kind of two schemes might necessarily have anything to do involved with that but if there's anything you want to add go ahead 
Yeah, uh, shall I say something about the design process? Well, qu quite a lot of control. I mean, part, part of it is, in our case, is because the architect lives here, but we, we all participated. We bought the site on the basis of pretty much what we ended up with. You know, it was what uh, we were expecting. And we'd already workshopped a lot of that stuff. Uh, again, so the, the, all, the, all the big decisions were, were, were made. We're, we're all directors of the company that own the freehold. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it, is our, it's, it is our choice that which has, I think, great strengths, but also has some drawbacks. Um, Francis, do you want anything about kind of Marmalade Lane's kind of design process? Or? Well, ours is a different context, so it wasn't working with an enabling developer, but I think, and we were very fortunate with town, and I would say that now I work with them, but um, <laughs> it worked really well, and I think um, it was great to have that sort of expertise of the architect and the developer sitting alongside the group, it really imagining what it would be like to live there, um, and it makes just such a difference when you move in having been involved in that process so that you start with that sense of ownership right from the outset i think that's really critical and you understand the reason for all the decisions that are made and take you have to kind of take responsibility for, for them the ones that didn't work out quite as you imagined <laughs> no that's great thank you very much for that uh, so let's have a look um so I think you've just marked it, you, I'll go come to you first for this one, but um, it's, um, asking about how um, kind of a group can approach a housing association and with the idea of community-led housing kind of proceed with that. So Phil, I'll come to you first and then Brian and Cara, if you want to bring anything in with that afterwards, I'll come to you then. So Phil, why don't you? Okay, we, we did approach the housing association. They were, they were one that had worked with, uh, you may, might have heard of it, it's now called New Ground, but it was known as Older Women's Co-Housing in, in, in London. So it was a housing association that had some track record of this, and we were really hopeful that we could make it work. But I think as Barbara alluded to, in the end, we, 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 we couldn't, and we had spent two years of it, and we decided if we were going to do it, we had to do it ourselves. I think the options are probably greater now. I think what town are doing is opening up a lot of things, but there are other support mechanisms that weren't around when we were trying to, to, to do this. Great, thanks. Um, Carol, Brian, so I think you want to add about kind of Lavenham's work? Yeah, yeah if, I, if I may, um, we, the, within the parish of Lavenham, we'd already worked with the housing association we chose. We chose to work with Hasto Housing because Tasto had great experience of rural development. They also had experience of um, community land trusts. Uh, we also, um, uh, at, the, at the time, I was also chairman of the parish council, and we used to have regular housing enabling meetings with uh, members of the district council and uh, community action Suffolk and so on and so forth. And we would bring in uh, people from the housing associations to just talk to us about what was going on and how we could develop things and basically we built up a, a good relationship with Hasta and it really did pay off when it came to you know getting on with it because as, as was remarked earlier we did this in what some people said was breakneck speed some of that is down to the fact that I'm impatient but also we just had a team of people who could work together we could all you know, in those days, we could all sit around a table. And even during the development process, when the things were going up, you know, when you go down to colours and, you know, bits of detail, again, we knew one another, trusted one another, and um, it, it, was a, it was a good investment of time before we started development. No, that's great. I think you touched that really important there about kind of the partnerships that you come out with as well as kind of kind of your rural enablers, um, obviously you have a hub being here as well, there are people that will probably have contact as well can help you fit in with those people, um, put you in touch with those people and kind of help you make those connections now as well. So yeah, yeah definitely very valuable relationship. Could, could I just come back on, on that slightly? I think one of the difficulties for us was the housing association weren't really used to dealing with only your occupiers as well and trying to make that interface work 
they I think they found it difficult and we certainly found it difficult in terms of who controls what and if that could be solved that could be a, a, a very powerful combination you know harnessing private equity you know individuals equity to a housing association to, to create you know diverse communities but it is difficult and we certainly found it difficult yeah it's really good to hear about the challenges people have faced as well as well as kind of painting this pretty picture it, it is it's challenging i think it's kind of people that are going to be aware of they're going to see what we've seen so it's definitely useful to hear that side of it as well um so let's see uh one probably for sarah and brian um is do you think south cams is unique in its willingness to kind of provide fund grant funding for arms houses and kind of when you had that did they kind of speak to influence who could access the housing um I, I don't know if they're unique or not. We're incredibly grateful for that funding because uh, it, it's it was it's going it's tight anyway, uh, and that that makes a massive difference to um, how we move forward. Um, they haven't influenced us. There was some discussion around what would happen if um, you know if they were ever sold, which is not in our game plan, um, and um, and and that's been sorted out. And I, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any issue with that. There are pros and cons between running houses as alms houses versus um, tenancies, and we've just chosen to go down the alms house route uh, for the future. Lovely, thank you. Just check and uh, so Francis, kind of another one for you i'm not sure how involved you are kind of with the angel yard norwich work that's going on but do you kind of is that something you could answer or is that something kind of the obstacles they've been facing kind of what's been kind of the challenges they've been facing there I didn't quite catch that question. I'm sorry. Oh, that was um, for Francis. That was sorry. Uh, just kind of I don't know how much you know about the Norwich scheme. But kind of, do you know kind of what the challenges they're facing there are? Or is it kind of being big? Yes. So I'm not. So th I think the challenge that that back in gosh, I think 2015, they an individual inherited some money in the group and purchased the site um, with planning permission, thinking it could all sail smoothly onwards and unfortunately it just didn't stack up financially um, and they and that's really been the struggle from then on um, and so there's going to be conversations about viability I think <laughs> down the line but that, that is the fundamental problem it, the land was bought at an auction and it probably they, she probably paid more than um was really viable. Yeah, no, I think I think finance and kind of viability was seeing a lot of the space. Yeah, like compromises have to be made and decisions have to be made that aren't always easiest. Yeah, absolutely. So it, a real struggle. But I think what's interesting about the three I showed is they all have a slightly, or in fact, all the four four co-housing groups that we've talked about today, they all have a slight a different context in terms of how they're financed and how they've come into being. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a really flexible model that can work across a range of different, it's, it's a range of different solutions. And I, one of the things I actually, I'm going to just segue, this, I think there was a comment in the chat from someone um, near Cannock Mill talking about the positive impact it's had on the local area. And I think that's one of the things about co-housing that can often be overlooked, um, but, it, having a co-housing community in area tends to have these sort of additional benefits to the wider community that are really helpful and within Orchard Park that's been very important because it's a relatively new fringe area and the sort of social networks and infrastructures aren't that well developed. No, thanks for that, that's really great. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left, I think we've been through most of the questions, so if anyone's got any kind of last minute questions, pop them in the chat, um, or if any of the speakers want to say anything, Phil, I think you just noticed you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to come back to that question of uh, viability, which is, is, a, is a really difficult hurdle. Uh, what we've found, though, is that, the, you know, it, it can command quite a premium, 
it's quite difficult to, to value. What you pay on our site is, is what it costs to build. And it wasn't, it wasn't cheap, you know, it was a, a, a difficult site, site to build on. Uh, and we've had trouble when we've, we've uh, put out tenders and some companies have, have looked at what we're planning to build and done the sums themselves and said, oh, this won't stack up, we won't, won't pitch for it. But, you know, we found actually people are prepared to, to pay that bit extra for, for that benefit. And uh, so, so we just base it on, well, this is what it cost us. And are you interested? And are the people interested out there? And have you got the money? And have you got the money? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, um, I think we've kind of come to the end. And if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for coming along tonight and talking about their schemes. Um, and thank you for all the attendees for um, listening as well. Um, we have got a, a question and answer session tomorrow at 5.30, that is our last event of the, this week. Um, so sign up tonight, you can sign up tonight until eight o'clock tonight. So if anyone um, wants to attend that, um, please, it's on our website where everything else is, so please go and sign up to that um, tonight. Obviously you won't be able to join, but please join if, if there's some interesting panelists on there tonight, tomorrow night. And there will definitely be great speakers as well. Um, and also, when you uh, leave the uh, webinar tonight, there will be a little feedback form. If you could please complete that, we'd really appreciate it and um, really help us for the future events and um, hopefully bring more webinars like this um, forward in the future. So, thank you very much for everyone attending. And um, again, thank you to our speakers. And, um, Please stay in touch with me from home and um, hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Okay, night, night.